It is my great honor. I'm Gina Ford with Agency Landscape and Planning. Thanks for the shout out. It's been a great joy working with Charles and John on this incredible day, and I can't believe it's here after all the conversation. It's a great honor for me to be moderating this discussion with some of my idols about landscape activism. I wanted to start by talking a little bit about activism. Through the lens of a dinner party, I had the great privilege to go to a few weeks ago celebrating Martha Schwartz's legacy at the GSD. And uh, it was amazing because people were getting up and toasting her, celebrating her advocacy in the 80s and 90s for art, uh, landscape architecture as an art form. And then someone would sit down and then she would stand up and she would say, oh, I was ridiculed. She would stand up. I was ridiculed quite a bit for that work, but I'm glad it, now you see it. Then someone else would get up and say, uh, you know, Martha's really taken on the climate crisis in her work. And she would get up and say, yeah, I was, that was really tough. People couldn't really move along with me. Uh, and then people would say, you know, tenured position at Harvard, what a significant role. And she said, yeah, I had to fight really hard for that because my male colleagues got it before I did. And then they were evaluating me. And so when I think about Martha and many of the women we're talking about today and practitioners we're talking about today, we can evaluate them based on their exceptional works, uh, in her case especially. Um, but more so, she has provided such an important role model to so many landscape architects to take on the mantle of landscape activism, watching her move through so much complexity uh, you know, the backwards and in high heels thing, um, really pushing a rock up a hill and showing us what it looks like every day in every way to fight a good fight. No matter what was thrown at her, she demanded access to opportunity. She demanded excellence in work. And she never backed down in the face of constant grinding interference. And in many ways, we're here today because of the contribution of people like her, bracket her here with Cornelia and her exceptional legacy and Julie's, whose legacy is still unfolding and equally powerful. Landscape architects whose shoulders we truly stand on. I thank TCLF for acknowledging these unsung legacies and really shining a light on them in a way that we um, really appreciate. I would be remiss not to acknowledge that this panel very much sees itself as part of that legacy and stream because we are moved along by some of the same currents. Activism in the context of landscape architecture isn't much different than other forms of social and political activism. It requires being sustained. Activism is about dedication and commitment, as we've heard, over long periods of time, seeking, as Julie has, to move the needle with every project, every process, every student, every person, every policy. It's direct action. You know, the work of Claude Cormier coming out of the school of Martha Schwartz and the mentorship. It's hands-on, rethinking methods to deliver engaged um, dialogue with users and community. And it's about change. Activist practices uh, like Cornelia's were looking way out on the horizon to move us towards something better, knowing that it was a long, slow journey. Uh, and typically motivated by a, a social or environmental mission, or as we'll see today, really both. It brings me today to this incredible panel, which I can't even believe my good blessings to be part of. Shalene Odbert, uh, Sierra Bainbridge, and Maura Rockcastle. Three women whose work and processes inspired me five years ago to start my own practice. I really did look to all of you uh, as inspiration for what it looks like to start a practice that was mission-driven. At agency, you know, we take on the mantle of we've chosen the position of being a feminist firm, really advocating for women's rights. Um, Charles has asked us to speak today. How do we decide to take a position? What does that look like? Mora's work at 10 by 10 explores new methods of investigation and design process. We're going to ask today, how do we create sustainable business models rooted in activism? Spoiler alert, it's really hard and we don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they found that funny. <laughs> <laughs> Direct action. Uh, as Selena, as, as Shalina's work at Kunkui uh, Design Initiative, uh, it's driven by hands-on process of deep, deep, meaningful community engagement. We ask today, what are the methods we use to sustain an activist practice? And lastly, change, moving towards change. As Sierra's work at Mass Design explores design as a tool of justice and dignity, we ask, how do we define success in the context of an activist practice? With that brief introduction, because there's so much to cover, I'm going to ask each of our panelists here to sort of set the table and talk a little bit about 
how they shaped their practice, why they shaped it, and how they've continued to maintain it. I first of all just want to say thank you. Thank everyone for having us, and hopefully there's some morsels that are useful and helpful for everybody here. And so far, it's just been so thrilling just you know, in the few minutes we've been here together. We talk about this idea that design is never neutral. It either heals or hurts, and that our mission is to research, build, and advocate for a design that promotes justice and human dignity. And we started to think about that in our very first project, um, working particularly with Paul Farmer, um, my late mentor. And this idea of accompaniment, which is really at the pace of the people and the patients that one works with as a doctor. Um, when you heal, it takes uh, however long it takes for that patient to heal, and that's not necessarily predictable. And as we think about structural violence and the need to heal from those things, we try to imagine how design can actually shift and make the policy change, make the structural change that begins that healing. But we may be working with communities from before design starts until much longer after something is implemented. Also, this idea of getting proximate, we learned from both uh, Paul Farmer and Brian Stevenson, the idea that you really need to be close every day as much as possible with your community. And when we were doing Bataro Hospital, we slept there. We were there for weeks and weeks for year, actually two to three years during the, the design and construction of that project. We're not able to do that on every project, but it helped us to understand how important it is to know that the expertise is actually in the room with us, that we as designers can ask the right questions to understand what the aspiration is, uh, but we have to be learning every minute from, from those experts. And through that, we've kind of started to develop ways of thinking and working that move those processes forward as potentials for change. And this comes from the theory of change methodology, but we've kind of mixed it up and worked through it so that it's actually a, our design methodology. Um, and it's iterative. We go around multiple times, and it is about impact. And so working with our, you know, our partners, sometimes it's a community, sometimes it is a single person, sometimes uh, it is, you know, more of a typical partner but or client. Um, but it's really helpful to bring a group of people to the table and ask together, what is the mission of this project? Because what we found is that even if people go into breakout rooms and Zoom, people often come back with very similar answers for that project, and that helps to build momentum and unity that actually fuels the project to go forward, especially through the more difficult moments. And method is where we design. Like, how do we actually make sure the design is achieving that mission? Um, and then wa wanting to always challenge and make sure that we're looking for the possibilities for impact, and then Finally, systemic change. What is the thing that this project can do to actually shift a system, whether it's even just our material choices, potentially, um, or something even greater? And then, you know, how do we use the building process itself? So we think about the potential for impact of design, but also the potential impact of construction. Um, really thinking about our material choice, how and where we hire from, where we source things, whether it's in you know, its initial form or going through and working with local craftspeople to refine that. Investing in the training along the way, whether it's designers that work in each of the countries or places that we're working in, or even training on site, that's always something that we're working towards. And the next challenge is how do we do that here in the United States? And then finally, upholding di dignity throughout all those processes. And a little bit about how do we find the way to make sure we have the time to do that. I think another thing that you know, when you think about accompaniment as something that has to go with the pace of the project and of the community that has to receive it. You know, the projects that we're working on, we've been working on for three or four years and we're just starting design. And that early work is where, as a nonprofit, we can get the funding to be able to have that support, to go through the fundraising, to go through the engagement with the communities and take the time that is needed. Again, and this is, you know, when we're working both in Rwanda and Africa, but even more so in the United States, I would say. And so that, this, this graph a little bit is just about that early investment. And then once we get that, then that can pay for our design fees. But it's so important to make the space and time for those early conversations that make sure that the work that we're doing is the work that's needed. And that also allows us to find projects that aren't necessarily coming through by RFP. Who are the people out there doing the work that needs the support of design, potentially? How do we gain expertise and then find ways of bringing that to those communities? 
um, who may not be in the position to put out an RFP. And so part of that funding is also for bringing that to specific communities. I time myself just to make sure we're all getting there. Um, our first and longest running project is our design practice. I think we all probably feel that way, especially when we're growing. But we're, you know, constantly learning. And so I think part of my conversation always and when I'm trying to share what we're doing is that it works for, it feels like it's working now. I think we have small hints of success, but we really won't know for 10 or 20 or 30 years what that impact has looked like. Um, but we try to involve, we're multidisciplinary, and I think for all the work that we're doing, it's really helpful when we're trying to tell a story that we can have in-house exhibition, um, that landscape and architecture and engineering can work really, really closely together when we're thinking about carbon. And, you know, the question is, how do we, you know, is, is growth also a question that we're asking now? Is that the way to have proof of concept that we actually can create a method of working that can serve this period of design that we're not necessarily able to through typical systems. And then this is our tiny team. So within that, we have an a landscape team, and, and uh, I'm part of the support system for that, and, and we're growing, and we kind of do this work across all of these, and finding the space for that team to also be with the community and create those relationships that make the, the work happen. Thank you. I'm Moore Rockcastle with 10 by 10. Um, and I'm just also very grateful, and I'm totally floored and a little humbled to be on this stage with these three incredible women and in a room with all of you. I've been so excited about this event for weeks. <laughs> so our approach to practice often begins with a question. Questions initiate dialogue. They're open-ended and extremely important for us in establishing a position around process. So much can be learned by the questions we're being asked or that we're asking of our communities, our collaborators, our clients, and each other. Some of our questions are quite large and universal, shared across our entire field. We question the definition or understanding of landscape as a term, as a discipline. The most common way of defining landscape is as a portion of a natural and cultural environment. It is material. And one of the earlier usages of the world word defines landscape as a way of seeing. To situate landscape as a verb, as an act of seeing, as a cultural and dynamic medium that is more than just an environment and a place, it allows us to understand what it does and how it works as a cultural practice. So our commitment to questions and process is how we position ourselves as activists. And there are four themes or actions that help define this further. They help to create a frame around how we maintain, understand, and power a position that is really intended to evolve. Committing to unlearning grounds a process-based approach to our work. Embracing what we do not know as a way of defying and challenging the typical structures and modes of contemporary process is really important for us. Kaina Lesky, in her book, The Storm of Creativity, writes, questions have a remarkable power to undo preconceived choices, to disrupt assumptions, and to turn your attention away from the familiar. Creative process comes from displacing, disturbing, and destabilizing what you think you know. The impulse to know <coughs> is a spark and a creative generator. Curiosity goes hand in hand, I think, with willingness, openness, imagination, and optimism. It perhaps is more of a mindset than an action or a theme but a commitment to embracing a practice of probing, not proving, of again asking questions rather than aiming to extract a meaning, prepares us to create generative points of departure for the design process. What methods do we commit to as landscape architectural practices to ensure that we begin intentionally in this way? How do the creative methods we deploy encourage us to shift our perspective, to remain open and embrace detours? When I say creative methods, we're describing a range of methods to observe, document, explore, and research landscapes. Embracing creative methods is a way of working that design, that catalyzes design innovation, but is also a tool for participation and engagement and collaboration across disciplines. And truth, we've heard a lot about the importance of truth today. And it really weaves itself through everything we do. Perhaps it's the basis upon which all of us are, are here today. Seeking and acknowledging truth is a choice. And where, you know, questions like where are we standing? Um, what has happened on this ground? What impacts does our environment continue to have on us? 
Who are we listening to? How are we listening? As our design field evolves to combat the issues of our time, climate change and just futures, how we practice is increasingly important. These are some of the critical issues of our time that our work and our field are collectively confronting. The tensions, truths, and stories deeply embedded in the physical, social, and political fabric of our landscapes. And we have a lot of power as we reveal, address, and call attention to these themes. And we need to be so careful with that power. And questioning it and finding different ways of seeing it is, is all a part of that, of that process. Compassion. As a field, we're all constrained by similar forces, perhaps professional and economic norms, but we can choose how we work and how we want to challenge those norms. For the most part, um, we're a group, we collectively are a group of exceedingly compassionate people, and we all acknowledge that confronting this work really is not easy. It's very hard. It takes grace and bravery and dedication and time. So time is another theme that you'll hear us all talk a lot about today. And I believe that the more transparent we can be as leaders, practitioners, but also as humans, the more vulnerable and powerful we become as activists. So how we work is also a strategic choice. We're actively working at 10 by 10 to do better at so many things, among them being as transparent as possible, being better mentors, building collective ownership, sharing information, holding the idea of a work-like balance, not as a dream, but as somehow a reality, which again, don't have so many answers for that, but it is a priority for our collective health. We celebrate our approach to the work we do through a lot of gratitude and love. So we're based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We just celebrated our seventh birthday in May. We're 17 amazing people. We're women-led and awaiting our WBE certification. We actively seek ways to sustain joy every day create a healthy culture where people want to be and to stay and to grow. I don't have time to read through all of these, but we are kind of co-creating these 10 values, editing and evolving these 10 values that kind of guide our work and our approach to the work. And they echo a lot of what I just said and kind of echo a lot, actually, of the things that I've heard my colleagues up here talking about. Um, so, yes. Good morning. I'm Shalina Odbert. I'm a founding principal of Kunkui Design Initiative. And Gina, John, Charles, thank you so much for having us today. And thanks for making space for this dialogue. KDI is a nonprofit design and community development firm of about 60 folks. Uh, we're spread across four core teams, design, planning, uh, research, and community organizing. And we work across four offices in Los Angeles, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, the Eastern Coachella Valley in California, and Stockholm. We also work across disciplines uh, to create what we term a more just public realm, where just equals complete, not missing any of the essentials, inclusive, uh, open to all people, and resilient, resilient environmentally, but also socially and economically. And we do this across geographies that have been excluded, harmed, or otherwise marginalized by traditional design and planning processes. So why focus on the public realm? Well, despite the common understanding of public space and the public realm as a place that's open and accessible to all regardless of category, what we know is the reality of the public realm as a free and accessible and unbiased uh, space for, it, for all is not the reality. In fact, that free, and free accessibility is often relegated for a very narrow few. More often for people of color, women, the LGBTQIA community, and others, the public realm is instead intimidating, exclusionary inaccessible and contested. And this matters because we know empirically that the zip code that you live in is the greatest predictor of your life expectancy. So if you live in Malibu, you're likely to enjoy 90 years of life. If you live a few miles down the road in Watts, you'll have just 75. And what the data makes plain 
in that 15-year discrepancy is that this number isn't a matter of genetics or even access to health care. It's a matter of access to a just public realm. You live 15 years longer in Malibu because you have access to social infrastructure, schools, public spaces, cultural centers. You have access to safe streets, safe public transportation, and safe housing. And you have equal access to healthy air and water in a place that's away from environmental hazards. And what we see most clearly when we look at this list is that this is not a list for doctors and nurses to provide. Instead, it's a list of things that every one of us in this room shape in our practices, alongside others, of course, but we too are on the front lines. So across four scales and across four main service areas, we work to ensure that those 15 extra years of life are within reach of everyone. So we design and build those amenities that are missing from communities, but we also do the long-range planning that's needed to ensure that the future of a community is inclusive. We also change policy that stands in the way of equity in the built environment. And oftentimes, we have to first build data sets that begin to tell the full story of a people and a problem in a place so that we can ensure that resources adequately and more equitably flow to those challenges. And then finally, whatever the project type is, we do it through a shared design and decision-making process with community members that is iterative and, and moves throughout all phases of a project process. And this iterative participatory process is just one of three core principles that guides us. The other two are what we call networking and integration. And networking is the simple idea that one project, no matter how great it is, is never enough to address a problem at scale. And so we make a commitment to a community or a region over the long term to network interventions and projects that collectively shift these outcomes at scale. And integration is mm -hmm. the simple understanding that the challenges of justice in the public realm are intersectional, meaning they aren't just design challenges. And so the solutions have to be intersectional too. So we work to layer social and economic change elements into each of our physical or policy-driven projects in the built environment. I've clearly traumatized them about equitable time, because they're all <laughs> keeping time up here. So moderator job done. You're welcome. Um, so <laughs> you all, you all, um, we're going to talk for a few minutes. We're trying to unpanel this, and then we'll do some, show some project work. So that was an introduction to your practices. You all touched on how you think about success in your own ways, right? The ending, uh, Shaleen, as you did on the idea of networking and how do you move to scale feels like one of those things. But given what Sierra shared about so much of many of these systems are about long periods of time, that kind of long view or long horizon. How do you, as practice, within your practice, define success? How do you measure it? When do you see it? Start with you, Fred. I was like, are you <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I mean, I think to build on what Chilino was talking about, I think we've also learned that part of being with a community for a long time is, again, committing to that geography. And you have, like, multiple projects must occur within a typology mm -hmm. or within a geography or within a discipline, perhaps even, in order to create, to have that bubble up and, and have those work together to create the shift. So, you know, I think we felt like we had had some, and, and the intent in the end is to create this structural shift that we're impacting the mm -hmm. policy. And so I think, you know, the hospital projects in Rwanda was our first clue about that. We we did one, but sought to do multiple. And, but that one was different enough that we were then asked to do the design typology um, structural framework for healthcare in Rwanda. And then that impacted two or three other projects. And now that whole, both interior, exterior, landscape, architecture, all of that is starting to shift and it impacts all the other healthcare that's happening there. And so we brought that here. We work in Poughkeepsie. And it's, if you want to, you know, Poughkeepsie is a third tier. Um, city in the United States that was eviscerated by urban renewal. 
and doesn't receive a lot of funding because it's one of the smaller cities. And despite the kind of massive transformation of the entire Hudson Valley, it's just jumped over. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're also working with the local organizations, not one project or two projects, but three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten projects, right. all of them going at different paces, some of them getting built, some of them far in the horizon. That will be the thing that can bubble it up versus us being responsive or opportunistic about projects that come in the door. Right. It feels like a unique thing that Mass is doing, that you're sort of um, hunkering down, hunkering down and sort of seeding, um, you call them labs, right? Kind of mm -hmm. offices yep. that are meant to start that process. What about you, Maura? What does success look like at 10 by 10? I think it's maybe a little simpler. It's even just like being a part of a conversation or multiple conversations, that the work is tapping into something greater than just itself, like each individual project. So, um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about, and that sometimes that multiplicity of projects that are sort of attached to a singular theme, like, you know, division of highways, you know, or urban renewal and highway construction. So being able to develop a research project around the public history of 35W, for example, connects Rondo and MCAD and a bunch of projects we have within the Twin Cities uh, together, or, um, you know, the River Valley projects, which are a lot of the engagement with our indigenous partners, which I'll share later, are really tapping into ideas of land back and repatriation of human remains. So these projects that really get at mm -hmm. bigger conversations that allow us to invest time through a multiplicity of projects, that's what success is looks like for us. Yeah, it was a lovely moment last night at the reception when um, there was a discussion about 35 and how it racially divides um, Minneapolis all the way down to Austin, Texas and further south. So um, that was fascinating. Thanks, Maura. What about you, Shalina? What, is, what does success look like for Kankui? When we started KDI, we were students and one of our kind of core ideas at the time was we could start small and leverage well, as we say. Um, and that idea has really, I think, come to define what success looks like mm -hmm. for us. What we meant at the time, and, and I think what we're seeing now, uh, 12 plus years later, is that um, there's the success of just getting a single project done. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes, the success is even before that. It's getting someone um, or some agency to acknowledge that a project needs mm -hmm. doing. And that success is important. It's really important for the communities that you partner with that typically in our case are communities where there's a legacy of broken promises and failure uh, to deliver uh, success in many ways. But I think to stop there is is to sell short the power of design and the systems thinking that we all bring to our work. So success for us more critically means leveraging those individual projects uh, to change in the way uh, projects are delivered at a larger scale, at the scale of the city, at the scale of, in some cases, the country. Um, and, and to do that, it's about being successful in changing policy, in changing process, in changing uh, the way resources flow. Mm -hmm. And so by default, our work has had to get much bigger than just the, uh, the design and planning of individual projects. Uh, because if we aren't also working at that policy scale to kind of clear the pathway for these individual projects to um, scale up and, and grow outward, then I think we're leaving a lot of uh, impact, potential impact mm -hmm. on the table. A another question before we jump into project work was um, just recognizing last night as we were at the reception and talking just how much we're all doing. You know, everyone I talk to is just that, that's here, that's committed, that's passionate about their practice. Uh, is doing it across multiple fronts, is sharing that dialogue broadly, is also oftentimes mothering um, or, you know, has a, a, a personal life. How do you all, how do you all look at, you know, maintaining and keeping your energy and where you put it? You know, what do we do with this one life and how do you sustain? I'm looking at more and she's like, I don't know. <laughs> I just took a deep breath. <laughs> deep breaths, Breathe. deep breaths. <laughs> a lot of breathing. I, I, you want me to? Sure. I, yeah, it's a perplexing and energizing question at the same time. I mean, I think um, I talked a little bit about joy, and um, there's 
there is a joy also that comes from sort of committing to things that you know are important and that aren't being committed to mm -hmm. and seeing that gap. So I think that's where it comes from. It's just, and also a greater sense of responsibility for things beyond ourselves. And so gathering people around you that share that um, together, I, mean, I don't think any of us could do it alone either. So there's a community we're doing this with and collaborators that are really important to sustain that energy to find more of that energy to to push us and challenge us so it's kind of like mm -hmm. you know it's you're being fed by it and you're learning all the time as Sierra said earlier it's just like a constant and some of us thrive in those environments <laughs> most of us might thrive in those environments I I certainly echo much of what you said Maura um, I guess I would also say one thing that I think has existed from the beginning of our practice is this understanding that to do this work, you really have to be comfortable with the struggle. Mm -hmm. and you have to see those setbacks, those big fights, those kind of public moments of um, dissension and, and discourse as part of the process, yeah. as opposed to these things that um, set you back or um, kind of push you down or push you away from, from your goal. And I think that the people that come to KDI uh, come comfortable with the struggle because they're a part of it. They are, we uh, by and large are part of these communities where we work, uh, connected to them in one way or another. And so it, it's something that is very personal to mm -hmm. us and, and who we are and, and how we identify. And, and in that way, we see it not as so much as um, someone else's problem to solve, but it's our way of um, using our professional lives to contribute to the things that are personally relevant and important yeah. to us in shaping uh, with our time on this earth. Sierra? Uh, I have so many things <laughs> spinning around, but um, I mean, when, oftentimes we're working with um, communities where the need to resist is not really a choice. And I think when we keep that very, a, a consciousness very front and center of the work, it is the fuel. Yeah. And when you speak with those people, how do you, you know, keep pushing when there's so much other work just to live? And it is, you know, that's the answer, that if I don't resist, I can't keep doing all those other things. Okay. And so I think keeping that front and center, and, but I would say on the other side of that, it's exhausting, right, for everybody involved. Um, most of all those communities who've, you know, been part of the, the struggle for so long. And we're just learning, I think, as an organization that we're not trained in school to do the work that we're doing in many ways. Yeah. We're trained as designers, but we're not necessarily trained in how to have these conversations, how to confront and work with communities that are traumatized and that are re-traumatized through the conversations, and that even our designers suffer that. Yeah. And so we're actually, like, very actively seeking help for within our office, especially if we have members of the community who are also doing the design work. It's a lot. Yeah. And so how do we provide the support through, you know, trauma assistance um, right. as designers, as well as learning how to do that for the work, through the work, at, which, you know, we're not even at all expert on yet. No, and we're, like, I know. And digging into the research teach, to understand. Teaching, too, to kind of ask those questions, to find ways to build time to ask those questions. It's really beautiful. Um, thanks, team. We're going to jump to show some project work, since we're the practice panel. <laughs> Let's dig in. Ready. We're all familiar with the idea of structural violence, and these are these aspects of our social structure and our social institution that force harm on people by not being able to have the things that are needed for daily life, whether it's healthcare or education, and that list can just go on and on. And I think part of what we learned very much from Partners in Health and their grounding in that work is the idea uh, that where there is harm, there is also healing. And so that is where we have to create the hope to move through this. Um, and we started to think about our projects in these structures, the idea that where there's physical violence, cultural violence, structural violence, we can find methodologies through our work, through our conversations for physical healing, cultural healing, and structural healing. And I'm just going to talk really quickly through a few projects and the learning. So again, we were invited by Dr. Paul Farmer and, and Agnes Benoit, who was the 
a director of the Ministry of Health in Rwanda at the time and at the behest of President Kagame to build a hospital in the north of Rwanda where we had never been before. I moved there without having ever visited <laughs> to a place where there were you know, 400,000 people with zero access to doctors. And so there were days and days of walking if you needed to get to the nearest health center or if you needed secondary or more intensive care to a hospital. And it was also, I think, a huge learning. Paul Farmer uh, was obsessed with plants and landscape and saw this as a way of dignification, that when you create a space that looks beautiful, that looks well taken care of, it really creates a confidence in a patient that they also are going to receive the care that they need. And so it, this started as an architecture project, but very early on, uh, Michael came and was like, I think we need some landscape architects. And he asked actually Mora, and then Mora asked me to join her, and that was our first project together. And it was really also about how do we create, therefore, the landscape and the architecture as completely seamless systems um, that are working towards the reduction of airborne disease control through having free-throwing air by how we locate those buildings, um, that everyone also has beautiful access from each and every bed to views of the outdoors, whether it's the hillsides of Rwanda or the gardens on the courtyard, um, and that the buildings and the landscape together are creating the flow of air that's needed to reduce um, airborne infection. And that, you know, learnings that we started there have just become so much more important as we've all learned through COVID. For structural healing, this project, I think, is a culmination of many smaller projects, but for us is the biggest project we've ever done and a kind of test of how do we bring all of those learnings together. And so this may be, we think of a little bit as like infrastructural healing. Rwanda is the most densely populated country in Africa in, since 1990 until today, even beyond 2017, has gone through this massive removal of the existing ecology in order to turn that over to farmland to be able to have income and production for what is an 80% um, agricultural community. And in so doing, kind of gone through many steps of removing that ecology, which is essential for the production of highly productive agriculture. And then the degradation that goes along with that, which is not just the water, but also those systems that need to support agriculture into the future, but are slowly um, with each and every crop and with grazing rotation um, becoming less and less productive. And so this project was for the Ministry of Agriculture in Rwanda and for the Buffett Foundation, a project of how do we create food sustainability for Rwanda into the future, um, food security. Uh, especially now when, despite being 80% agriculture, they're, st they're still importing food. And so we came at this from a One Health design um, proposal, the idea that human animal and ecological health are inextricably intertwined, which is actually something that stems from veterinary and healthcare philosophies. And ecology has yet to kind of step in as a discipline. And so we kind of took that on to think about how are we that third leg of the stool. And in this particular case, applying it to an agricultural system, the idea that zoonotic disease control transmission prevention is extremely important, especially as we kind of have, you know, domesticated and wild animals closer and closer together. Again, um, we see that through COVID. Uh, the regenerative agricultural practices that allow us to not be only 20 uh, harvests away from depleted ground and, and soil fertility, but allow that to be something that can continually grow and become more fertile over time. A harm no species approach and sequestration, sequestration at work. And those translate into, over time, we learned through this project, those also translate into very applicable low carbon goals. We did a deep looking at what can this site hold, actually. Lots of analysis across the entire place, and then looking at how that analysis becomes design. Um, and again, working with uh, local ecologists to get a full catalog of all of the plant flora and fauna of the site, learning that this is one of the only intact savanna woodlands outside of the national parks. Almost all the intact ecology is within the national park. We're not sure why this one was, whether it was a place that culturally was like a meeting um, of where the king would come and see uh, this area of Rwanda, or that there were several cats who lived in there, and so people just kept their, <laughs> kept their distance. But either way, it became for us a huge carbon sink, but also the source of the ecological content that allows agriculture to go from 7 to almost 40% higher productivity if you can have that interface of intact and thriving ecology with agriculture. You know, briefly, we looked at all of the different types of and learned a lot <laughs> about agriculture, you know, whether it's animal, poultry, tree, veg. We finally removed beef, which is super high carbon. And we found through all of this and the way that we work that having all of our carbon on all of our projects became something that we could achieve here and learn from past projects. 
all of these are below the global average, and the half of that, um, many of our projects are below that, and that is from those early ideas of sourcing locally and having local materials. So this one comes in at two-fifths for 64 buildings, 1,600 hectares, and 40 hectares of the campus itself. That's because 98% of the labor was sourced locally. It's 100% off-grid. We only went far afield for materials for things like uh, the solar uh, panels and the generators, and almost all the rest uh, was, was sourced within Rwanda or within East Africa. And then the question became, okay, if we can like reduce the amount of carbon that we're spending on a building, how do we go carbon positive? And that's where landscape always comes in. We are the people who can get all of our projects to carbon positive through this very kind of deep uh, interdisciplinary work. And these are the steps that, in my mind, you could apply to like a road median, or you can apply it to a region. The idea that you have to conserve the intact landscapes, restore the ecological functions uh, where possible, proliferate biodiversity, and sequester. And so here we, you know, not only the savanna forest, the papyrus wetland, but also the soils, and then preserving as much as we can, and then also enhancing all of that ecology on site and using it as a learning tool. We were able to collect and propagate 268,000 plants on site to be planted here. That's one of our very early projects, a road. <laughs> very exciting. Um, but we got to test out what that might look like and also kind of uplift native mm -hmm. plants as something that could be beautiful and ornamental in Rwanda. And then finally, cultural healing. This has so many different ways of interpreting it. And for us, this one is about our Memorials and Monuments Lab, where a lot of our current landscape work is. The built world is one of a proliferation of symbols, and they also are neither uh, not neutral, they either hurt or heal us. And that memorials have the power to remind us who we once were so that we may understand who we are and decide who we want to become. And this, you know, we saw Brian Stevenson's article in the New York Times and reached out. His intent was to begin to memorialize the lynchings all across the South in 17 states. Um, of the Confederacy, and was still trying to understand, is that best placed in D.C.? Is, is it in each state? And we reached out and said, we're, we're thinking about memorials. We're thinking about how do we use them as an activator, as a call to action, that they are not passive and a frozen moment in time, but they actually help us to understand where we are on this process of healing. This is the proliferation of Confederate memorials in Montgomery, where we determined that this place needs to be in the South. It needs to be where these things happen in the past and continue to happen in the present. And he picked the second highest hillside, the highest hillside being the government of the state and the courthouses where these the, the kind of violence of the structure continues to be perpetrated. And so this peer across from this hillside to that continuing amount of power. And then, you know, through this, working with him, these ideas of proximity, um, changing the narrative, being comfortable with being uncomfortable and knowing that that is part of the process created this commemoration to the 4,000 people plus who were killed through the murders of lynching and the communities that they represent. Each of them are gathered on 700 plus counties. The idea was that you move through this space that there's not only the potential for descendants or family members to have a place where they finally see the name of that person who may not have even been acknowledged that they were lynched or murdered unfairly or unjustly, but also to kind of find a way to have hope through that, to find a place to have the healing. And then finally, in the landscape, we have a duplicate of each of those modules, each, which represent one for each county with the name of those who were lynched on each of those modules. And the idea here being, this is the call to action, that if you are from that county, there is a process that you and your governments and your communities can go through to reclaim that and put this um, commemorative piece in your county on the courthouse lawn right next to the Confederate markers that still proliferate throughout the South and begin to create that dialogue and truth telling in each and every county. And there's a pretty, you know, particular process by which that has to happen. It can't just be someone says, I have space, let's put it here. There have to be kind of a process of bringing the government along, of bringing policymakers along, of bringing community along and acknowledging those truths as, as a group and not as individuals. And over time, this becomes emptied and it becomes an amphitheater for all kinds of gathering, whether it's you know, for performance or for commemoration or et cetera, however EJIC is fit to use. But how many of these remain is somewhat of a measure of the extent to which we have or have not come to terms with that, um, that mode of structural violence. Thank you.
So we're working on a handful of projects within the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers across the Twin Cities, um, sort of to the south and west of the Twin Cities. There's a lot of shared themes and partnerships and processes of discovery for these projects, so I'm going to kind of start with those and then move into two particular projects. And all of these, sort of fundamental to understand, these projects are on Dakota land and engage deeply, all of them engage deeply with a range of indigenous partners. Dakota elders tell of the creation of humans occurring in their homeland of Minnesota Makoche, but specifically at the place called Maka Koyaka Kin, the center of the earth. This place is Bedote, which is a geographic term and means where two waters come together. And in this ist instance, for these projects, is where the Minnesota River joins the Mississippi River. Our work within the River Valley is in partnership with the City of St. Paul or City of Minneapolis, particularly the Park and Recreation Board. Uh, Dakota County or the Minnesota Historical Society, and uh, particularly the tribal historic preservation officers from four of the federally recognized Dakota tribes in southern Minnesota, and depending involve uh, additional tribes across the upper Midwest. These projects are guided by an acknowledgement of the <laughs> unique worldview of our Dakota partners, and a central tenet of that is this idea of Metakue Oasi or all of my relatives, we are all related. And this describes a notion of profound respect and responsibility to the natural world that many of us can't comprehend. So these, um, this kind of worldview and some of the questions we're asking for all of this work, um, a few of them, there's a lot of questions, but what is our role in telling stories that are not our own? How can landscape reveal truth and build kinship? And how can we undo the idea of making place? We have so many collaborators for these projects, as I mentioned. We're also working with cultural landscape architects and planners, Dakota artists, activists, educators, storytellers, and writers. And we're engaging with them in different ways in each of these projects. Again, constantly learning and finding better ways of, of doing that, more, more significant ways of funneling money, um, project funding, and deci decision-making authority um, into their hands each time. And we also begin by asking how our partners want to be involved, both the tribal leadership and preservation officers, as well as um, more urban indigenous collaborators, because it often changes as you go through the process. This is a map prepared by the Shakopee Midwakatan Sioux community, showing their living relationships to these landscapes over time. It's an ongoing project, uh, frequently updated. Um, so many of these stories and histories have been displaced or lost. And it's important to have this as a reference as I talk about these projects because the way I'm going to talk about it is, is different uh, than the way that it's understood. And it's something that I am also still learning how to do better. And I wanted to honor uh, the way that they understand and see these landscapes. We spent a good amount of time doing more traditional mapping and research, looking through historical archives to collect photographs, paintings, and maps. This work is a little bit more conventional or literal, but it's still important, and especially in how it comes together as a combination. You start to reveal the tensions and layers of history, different accounts and perspectives. You can document change over time and the impacts of human imposition, and you can start to lay the foundation for truth with this mapping. One of the most direct and powerful tools to realize truth and not overlook the difficulty of dealing with sadness and trauma are words. I felt that so powerfully in your, your beginning talk, Jane. They help us shake free preconceived notions of a place or a type of landscape. They help call out biases and conflicts. When we just state it like it is, you can see in the room the sort of physical, the struggle, the realization, um, how people are starting to contend with their own worldview. Discomfort, as we've talked a lot about, through truth is necessary to understand harm and ongoing systems of harm. Words can be one of the best ways to acknowledge those complexities and truths defining the land upon which we're being asked to work. Ownership is often unclear, untrue, and contested in so many of these projects. And defining what public space means, even the notion of placemaking, as I mentioned in that question, is incredibly complex and sometimes even offensive. Our indigenous partners have asked us to spend more time in these landscapes. And not so much as part of our process of engagement, but that's important too. It's more of where is the design coming from and how do you understand this place? And we've learned so much from this simple invitation. How can we see and understand landscape differently by committing to that idea of spending time? These experiments and drawings use the materials of the site, the ice, the river water, the mud, the plant fibers, the qualities and information that emerge from getting more intimate with what makes each place unique, captures a temporality, it activates the senses, 
It, it helps us build relationships with these landscapes in different ways. And that familiarity and understanding of the phenomena builds respect. Here's some more mud drawings made from core samples or squishing watercolor paper into the ground at the edge of the water and large format drawings on the right that play with opacity or saturation, layering, overlaying or experiments to better understand or think about what we're representing and how we're actually seeing and un understanding the landscape and our experience of it. There's such a value in learning over time. Again, building these relationships with sites are difficult within three to five site visits. I mean, how many of us have wrote a proposal with, we'll, we'll come five times. Um, how do we reconcile spending time when we don't live in the places that we work? So the rivers are luckily in our backyard, and we're able to ask you know, a question like, how does the edge between land and water change over the course of a year? Both our experience of it as a horizon or a layering of horizons, as well as our experience of the edge itself. And then we can visit that edge once a week for an entire year. This is just a few of those visits. Photographs, even just thinking about how you document in places that you live, not just snapshots, but panoramas, transects, detail inventories, thinking about large lengths of terrain, 17 miles along the Minnesota River here, um, engaging with community members who can't travel to these sites. How do we begin to kind of make graphics that visually can bring these elders to, to the table? So there's a lot of different techniques we've, we're continuing to work on about how to document inventory and collect plants from these sites with these big, um, my colleague Sydney has these huge fold-out accordion books of just plants from these sites that she photographs, and they become a part of that kind of virtual room and engagement with elders who cannot travel. And these plants and inventories are incredible storytelling triggers. So the first project I'll dive a little bit deeper into quickly is Indian Mounds. We started working on this site in 2019 and co-led kind of creation of a messaging plan to accompany a cultural landscape report uh, with Quinn Evans. This site is known to most people as Indi Indian Mounds Regional Park, and you can see in these image images how that the kind of painful reality of desecration and removal and reconstruction without consent has led to that perception. This place is not a park, and this project represents a difficult challenge. How can we change the community perception of this site, an indigenous place of burial drastically altered over time to function as a public park toward a perspective that is informed, empathic, and respectful of its sacredness? As we listened to early engagement conversations with the community and our urban indigenous and tribal community members, we understood that by continuing to show those maps with boundaries and lines, on this sacred place were causing pain and harm. The conversation wasn't moving forward. And we were perpetuating colonial perspectives and structures in doing so. So we shifted away from that method of drawing for a while, um, trying to honor that pain. And we were looking at watercolors or ways of kind of erasing or acknowledging a lack of a boundary tried to think about you know, how to look at it through section. How do we draw the idea of this deep water or layers of cultural history? This is a section that animated um, the relationship between the springs and the water in the caves and the river um, and the stars and sort of this cyclical way of living and being connected with the animals and the rocks and the water that is not, is not a, our, our worldview, my worldview, but is what I heard was important. So we as a team started to try to understand how to redraw, uh, re-represent. Ultimately, we do also have to draw the traditional plans to convey the messaging strategy within the report itself. These drawings really intended to communicate the sacredness and boundlessness of this place. And we proposed a variety of messaging features um, and co-management strategies that aimed to build respect, restore dignity, and actually kind of remove uh, layers of park-like features over time. So we leaned into a kind of messaging through ecology, acknowledging that a sign isn't just going to cut it. These need to be sort of massive reclamation projects um, with culturally significant plants and ways of communication, but that needs to happen slowly. So this is an idea about a threshold of cues that sort of start simply on the edge of the path, and that over the next 20 years will grow and take over the whole site. Um, so again, bringing community along with a process that is going to take time, shifting perspectives is not going to happen overnight. And park pavilions, there's park pavilions and a playground and sculptures and a cell tower sitting on this sacred ground. Um, so how do we show a slow decommissioning or, of that? We can't remove it entirely because that actually causes more damage to the ground. 
Um, so you keep some of it, but you turn it into a messaging opportunity. And we did the third, you know, a, a call for moving forward was to stop work actually and do immediate acknowledgement on the site right away before any more work was done. So we developed a kind of adaptation of the existing signage to again start to shift the narrative and build respect, use the Dakota language, use their stories and start embedding it in these existing features. Again, a slow acknowledgement of a process and a relationship that people have with the site that needed to change. And then quickly, historic Fort Snelling at Bedote is on a bluff up right above the confluence. It is a place of Dakota spirituality and history, and it is also their creation story. Um, so it is a place of pain and trauma where 1,700 mostly women and children were forced into a concentration camp where two chiefs were hung on this site, um, where families were put onto steamboats and shipped to other parts of the country. So it's a place of genesis and genocide. And these stories have been sort of systematically erased over time. So thinking about how to, to show that deep layer of history, how to understand how things have shifted and changed, and then how to bring back a way of moving through this landscape or restoring this landscape that honors um, the deeper part of history, the layers that aren't being told. Um, so trying to capture the meaning of place, again, through movement, through relationships with plants, through a way of acknowledging the bluff and the river, not through orthogonal lines that honor a military history, but through a way of kind of foraging or um, being embedded in a bluff landscape and then revealing the river. Um, so this idea of weaving or braiding ecological layers and movements, offering moments to acknowledge the river, places of remembrance and memorial where awful things happened. So again, it's removing all the turf, restoring this prairie, messaging around the plant nations, and then this is a, a treaty feature, uh, pulling out the one sentence of the treaty that all of our Dakota members knew by heart, and thinking about how those words could be situated in the landscape, again, not on a panel, but in a way that sort of pulled the body through it, um, and that the words that were not honored were not upheld, those promises that were not kept, you can see the landscape through that, but you can't actually move to the landscape from those. So this idea of a kind of a barrier, those words in the treaty framework prevented access, changed relationships to this land. So again, interpretation that creates a feeling or an understanding in a very physical and different way. Thank you. Thank you both for those inspiring uh, presentations. It's always great to see your work up close. I want to talk about <clears throat> two projects, and actually they're more like initiatives because there are many projects, smaller projects layered into them. The first initiative is about creating a public realm uh, where there wasn't one. Uh, literally no parks, no sidewalks, no gathering spaces in a region. And the other is then about activating a public realm that had been uh, overlooked and, and as a result become unsafe and accessible and lacking in many other ways. The first project is uh, what we call the Eastern Coachella Valley Initiative. And this work uh, it really is a direct outgrowth of our, our first and longest running project, with, which is uh, the Kibera Public Space Project, uh, which was the work that we started as students and continues today. Kibera is one of the uh, largest informal settlements in East Africa uh, and is in Nairobi, Kenya. And there we started with <clears throat> a single public space, pointer is, but um, down at the bottom of the screen there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Maura. Um, and over the last decade, we uh, have grown a, a a network of 12 public spaces that reclaim waste spaces along the tributaries that cut through the settlement uh, to create, again, uh, purpose-built public spaces in a settlement that prior to this had none. So as we began to work in the U.S., we discovered that the same condition, a complete lack of public space and public realm infrastructure, existed just a few hours outside of Los Angeles. Uh, this time not in a dense urban environment, but instead in a very rural farm worker community, uh, which is the eastern Coachella Valley. For those of you familiar with Palm Springs, that's what we call the west side of the valley. Um, and you can see just by looking at this simple map 
um, already where those inequities lie in terms of um, how the how green space is allocated, how um, grids and, and uh, transportation networks exist on one side versus the other side. It's important to note that both halves of this valley are under the same county jurisdiction, which makes this uh, disparity in how resources are allocated and how decisions are made even more striking. So over the last 10 years of working in this valley, uh, we have uh, started again with the idea of public spaces we did in Kibera, but we quickly learned that public space was just one element of the public realm that needed to exist in order for uh, a public realm to really address the priority needs of a community. So we started uh, with reclaiming simple and vast open spaces like this one uh, for the priority needs of the community around public space. And through community processes where we worked hard to meet residents where they were on times and, and in ways that were convenient for them, we began to put forward a vision for what a community-driven, authentic public space that reflected the the identity and the values of the community that lives in this space and that makes it what it is. This region is one of the most important agricultural regions in California. We were able to transform that five acres of open space into a purpose-built public space that was the first in the east side of the valley. This place has become not just um, a, a simple place of leisure, but also a place of political organizing, of cultural celebration, of economic activity. There are uh, women, some of the leadership that we were able to help the community grow as part of this participatory process has transformed into a women's food cooperative that takes some of the home-based businesses that were, that are prevalent in this part of the valley and uh, formalizes them and then brings them into this public space. The site is now a, a very beloved and iconic space, not just for the residents, but importantly as, a, as an action of, of identity, um, an important public space for the region and something that when put side by side, even with parks that are found on the West Valley, um, something that uh, people are drawn to and people see as uh, different and um, monumental in many ways. As we started to build these public spaces, and we're now, we now have two built and, and a few others in development, uh, we heard from residents that public spaces uh, without a way to reach them uh, were, was going to again leave some of that potential impact on the table. And in this part of the valley, when we first started working there, the public transportation system didn't even extend to the, to the west, to the east valley. At the beginning of our work there, that began to change through a strong group of community organizers. But even when the public transportation system did come, you can see, as you see from that lone post, which is a bus stop, that it was severely inadequate. And so the second bit of our work was to understand why there was such a stark difference and how to change that. And so we started with the act of long-range planning. We put together mobility plans that we convinced the county to adopt that would open the way to um, the, the state financial resources that would allow the county to build the first miles of, of sidewalk and pathways. And those pathways, uh, were, we were able to then move beyond that to fund the first, first 14 miles of, of those sidewalks connecting, among other things, the parks and these bus stops. But as you saw from that bus stop picture, the sidewalk wasn't enough. When a bus comes once an hour in a desert where temperatures are regularly 120 degrees, the lack of shade becomes not just an inconvenience but a severe inequity. And so the next piece of this initiative was taking on shade. And again, through a co-design process, uh, we've begun to pilot what it could mean to have simple shade structures that live alongside of these bus posts that you saw. Uh, the first one was just uh, launched a, a few weeks ago and has been um, 
such it has had far more success than a simple little structure like this should have and is has been really um, embraced by the transportation department as well as the community and, and has a bright future. But again, alongside of all of these individual activity, individual challenges, there was a looming environmental hazard in the form of the Salton Sea, which is California's largest lake and has uh, many, many ecological challenges that spill out into and become health challenges and other economic create other economic challenges for community members. So in taking that on, we st have started with first a, a simple advocacy campaign to begin to tell the full story that the challenges here are not just of the flora and fauna, but also extend to the community itself. And through that process, we've begun to change um, not just the way that the problems are understood, but how the policy and the resources that are flowing from the state and even the federal level are working to address this. And of course, uh, no, no work in this region could be complete without thinking about the housing s structure itself, uh, where folks live in out-of-date mobile homes uh, without access to clean water, safe electricity, and so we have two affordable housing projects, potentially a third underway, where we're looking at um, working alongside housing developers to think about not just how you provide structure, but how those structures then feed into a larger public realm. And in the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about another initiative that's in Los Angeles. And this is, the again, an idea that came out of our work in Kibera, where we took thought about this idea of reclaiming waste spaces. In Los Angeles, half of the city doesn't have access to a public space, and the half of the city that doesn't have access is almost entirely the low-income communities of color. And at the same time, there are no, there is not a lot of available land that could easily just be uh, purchased and transformed. And so we had to look for other ways of reclaiming space and returning it to the public. So I'll just show a series of images that show many different ways that we've approached that. One is through using the streets where we fabricated a kit of parts, a, a park in a box, if you will that is deployed along the streets of Los Angeles where community members ask for it on a recurring and regular basis. That project has been adopted and um, embraced by Philadelphia where they have uh, incorporated this kit of parts into their play streets. We've also looked at the city-owned vacant lots, of which there are many in this under-parked and under-resourced parts of the city, and uh, encouraged and convinced the city council to make those lots available for communities to adopt. Again, we've uh, fabricated and prototyped a kit of parts that residents can then use to rearrange in ways that they see fit to create temporary public spaces that over time become permanent public spaces through development partners. And lastly, we have uh, found many opportunities for creating a public realm alongside uh, the river and the tributaries of the LA River, where you find these channelized pieces of space adjacent to gated off swaths of open space that are adjacent to housing. And in many places, like this project, for example, the only uh, public housing project on the west side of Los Angeles that is immediately adjacent to this creek and all of the recreational amenities has no gate or no practical way to access that. So creating these new access points and reclaiming these uh, swaths of unusable space alongside these washes have been another way in which we have uh, begun to make a way for public space in a place where density made that look impossible. This last project is the same idea, but reclaiming parking lots, of which you know LA has plenty. Thank you.